Welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with my co-host, Frédéric Ernst. Today, we're speaking with Nico Julia, who is co-founder and CEO of SoRare, and I couldn't be more happy to have him on. Um, but before we talk to Nicola and uh, get into SoRare and uh, NFTs and the gaming industry, uh, let's first talk about our sponsors this week. DEXs are great, but they're vulnerable to problems like MEV, failed transactions, and high gas costs. CowSwap tackles these issues head on and offers a new kind of trading experience. It's built by Gnosis, and CowSwap is a meta DEX aggregator. I like to call it a DEX aggregator aggregator, and it fights MEV by matching overlapping orders directly. So if no coincidence of wants is found, that's where the cow comes from. Um, trades are settled but on a variety of on-chain AMMs, depending on which pool offers the best price. So give CowSwap a try and enjoy some nice perks like no gas fees paid for failed transactions. Uh, it has optimized transac transaction management uh, for multi-sigs and uh, DAOs, as well as some other fun and entertaining surprises. Head over to cowswap.exchange and start swapping today. And I think, Felica, there's a few things um, that you wanted to tell us about regarding CowSwap and some updates. Yeah, so basically, uh, CowSwap is going um, up and up. So we've had 2.5 billion trading volume um, since we launched eight months ago uh, from 28,000 distinct traders. And um, we have launched a Cowfiliate program. So basically, if you want to um, learn more about how to get your friends into this and benefit both, um, go to cowswap.exchange. Great. Uh, Nicola, thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited to be here, and thanks, thanks so much, uh, Frédéric and Sebastian, to, uh, for having me. Yeah, for, for our listeners, uh, tell us about your background and how you got to where you are today. Um, just for context, so Nico and I worked together at Stratum, and I, I still remember, you know, seeing him come into the office uh, wide-eyed and, and, you know, wanting to learn about crypto, and, uh, you know, and so it's been a, a really fascinating journey for you since then so uh, tell us a bit about that yeah yeah of course uh, so yeah I'm, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sora and uh, I think that I've been uh, very lucky a couple of years ago I think it was the end of 2015 uh, to, to, to meet in Paris uh, amazing people like you Seb uh, Richard Caetano who uh, was the co-founder and CEO of Stratum this company we were working together with Seb and, uh, and François Dorléans and, and, and Stéphane Florquin and, and, and so basically you, um, you got me in, into this crypto so uh, I was before uh, working for a company where I'm you know, I, I've been working on uh, this blockchain use cases for for, for banks, uh, and uh, so I met you guys. I, I wanted to you know to be operational, to join a startup and do do something. Um, and um, so I was one of the first employees in uh, in Stratum, uh, uh, who was like a, a B two B uh, use case. So basically. You know, trying to uh, to help big corporates uh, to better trace complex uh, data and processes between them, leveraging the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, so I was one of the first employees, uh, and um, I, I spent two, two years and a half there, uh, like uh, doing sales and marketing and operations. Uh, and then uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was beginning of 2018. I saw uh, the NFTs uh, popping up, the popping up on the, on the Ethereum blockchain, uh, and uh, I was like, okay. Uh, this is interesting technology uh, and you know I was already like passionate about cryptocurrencies and I was like and crypto assets and I was like okay maybe uh, this could be the vehicle to bring crypto assets in general like to hundreds of millions of people uh, and NFTs are going to change the way we own something digital so um, yeah I, I, I I started being like uh, passionate about it, uh, and 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 uh, I'm a massive sports fan. So I was like, why not, you know, bring the image um, of uh, football players and clubs and fans on top of this technology, so that it's not just uh, a unique digital item, but it's something that you can relate to emotionally. Uh, that was the second pillar in, in in my thinking, and then the third one was okay, that could be massive. There's officially licensed NFTs, but I I want more. I want people to engage with them every day. I want 
I, I want people to do something. I want I want a usage value, not just collecting and trading. Uh, and that's the third pillar, the game design, uh, the fantasy sports angle. Uh, and with these three pillars, the tech, the partnerships, so the IP, the image, uh, and the and the you know the, the usage value, the game design, uh, with my co-founder Adrien, who's also like a next uh, stratum employee. Uh, we 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 you know we started building Sora uh, in 2018. Um, so yeah, that's that's the background, uh, and uh, and um, you know that's that's the very early days I would say. So I mean, you guys had this idea um, super early. I mean, like we're talking about 2018 when you know there have only been really like crypto punks and crypto kitties, and you know now now like everybody kind of gets the NFT vision now that there's been kind of the NFT summer and NFTs are everywhere and like Snoop Dogg is doing an NFT and like everyone's mom is doing an NFT, but you guys saw this like super early like wh- where where did this conviction come from that this was going to be huge so th- that's uh two two things i think uh so uh the um, the, the the first one is that um at the very beginning of an early technology of course you don't have millions you know of 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 people that know about it uh but y- you have an early community and f- from this uh, early community you can try to to measure or to gauge the level of love, the level of passion uh, that they have for it, um, and you know, I spent time in the CryptoKitties community and you know, there's all all these early projects, and I mean, I was just feeling that something something was going on here, uh, and that was not like the normal new tech or whatever. This was like beyond that, right? Um, and uh, and. So that that's one thing. Uh, I think the other thing is I have been passionate about cri- crypto assets in general and what they can bring to the world. Uh, and every time I was explaining Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies to my friends and even my friends, uh, some of them that are smarter than me, I was, I mean, it, it, it's hard. Like you, you, you need to go into, you know, like central banks and technology and game theory and politics uh, and it's it's really hard and and I had this huge frustration in me that you know I love that but it's hard for me to to explain and and and, and yeah it's really and when I saw NFTs I was like okay most of the properties are the same you know like digital scarcity true ownership like all these things that uh, that that are shared by all the type of crypto assets are the, are the same but it's much easier to understand right and um and uh, and so that that was a very powerful driver for me, like to 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 start because uh, because I was really feeling that I could um, you know I could help the broader space um, to to expand basically uh, and uh, and so that was a yeah a very powerful dri- driver for me to to to, to get started um, and um, no to get back to your concept that's yeah it's it's just this level of love and passion uh, from this early community. Uh, uh, plus, of course, like the fundamental properties of an NFT, like uh, and how it's fundamentally different than a traditional digital item, like di- true ownership, portability, digital scarcity, traceability, all those things. Um, I was like, okay, if I apply that to uh, how games or video games are built today, um, it's, it's just like putting everything upside down f- and, and, and 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 improving ten times what exists today for the fans. Um, and and so yeah. So I guess it's a combination of these three things, like the fact that it's going to reshape industries for the best, the fact that it's um, it's a way to drive, to bring crypto to a broader audience uh, and uh, this early passion from the early community. All these three things like convinced me that uh, I should yeah, definitely bet my career on that and build something around that. You've alluded to all the pillars that kind of underpin so rare, but um, we haven't really talked about what it actually is. So uh, maybe to get started, in a nutshell, what is so rare? Yeah, no, this, yeah, it's a good question. I should have started by that, maybe. Uh, but uh, yeah, Sora is, um, you know, it, it's a fantasy sports game uh, where you can play with officially licensed NFTs. So the high level, you know, view of Sora that is that, uh, and uh, and uh, we really sit at this intersection of fantasy sports uh, and NFT collectibles. So basically, if you start getting into the product, you would collect. Uh, 
um, a couple of NFT collectibles, like uh, a team of, uh, of players. And once you own five of them, then you can fill a team. Uh, uh, and um, based uh, on the performance of the players in the physical world, like in the real pitch, uh, you would score points. Uh, that's the definition of fantasy. Uh, and, and, and then at the end of the tournament, we just add your points uh, and you get ranked uh, on leaderboards and you can earn rewards that are ETH or NFTs or uh, physical experiences or physical rewards. So these are the three types of rewards you can uh, win. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the basic functioning of the product. Um, so maybe let me um, let me summarize this in my own words because I think this will be key to the interview and I am sure a lot of people don't know what fantasy sports are and I'm including myself here. So basically um, you have um, you ha basically it's a game where there is a collection of cards that um, that represent football players and you have to ch you have to um, you have to um, make up your own team from the cards that you own um, and you're scored on um, the physical performance of the individual players that make up your team um, uh, in the basically based on the performance in the real games that they play with with them um, you know their real teams um, and then basically you can compete against other people with also make believe teams made up from you know real personas yeah no i i think you are doing a way better job than me uh so that's a that's a 100 correct that's exactly uh, how it works so you you are competing uh against uh you know different uh, managers uh, around the, the globe we are you know we we have managers from 170 countries around the globe uh, we have different game modes uh, so we have the global all-star where you, you can play with players from Uh, like Japanese league, French league, Premier League, and so on. And then we have like more specific game modes where you can only play with uh, specific regions in the world. Uh, but the functioning, uh, as you said, is uh, this link with the real world. You have this NFT uh, representing a football player, and based on how he is doing on the pitch, uh, you're going to score points uh, and and progress in the game. That's that's really how it works. And and we have this bridge between the physical world. Uh, and the NFT world that is really at the core uh, of what we are doing uh, and in both ways like basically the performance of the players on the pitch impacts your performance uh, as a manager but the other way around if you are doing well as a manager you can uh, earn prizes some of them could be NFTs that are tickets uh, to go enjoy experiences in the physical world like meet a player, enter a stadium these kind of things so we are doing the bridge both ways If you kind of look back on the history of fantasy sports, this has been something that um, has taken a hold mostly in jurisdictions where gambling itself is prohibited, right? But it's kind of, it's spread from there. Yeah, so uh, fantasy comes from the US. It's very popular there. Um, you can think about fantasy. Uh, there's two popular modes of fantasy uh, before, like the mode that we are introducing, uh, the free-to-play uh, mode, um, like. ESPN Fantasy, Yahoo Fantasy, uh, and in Europe we have a lot of local players in fantasy soccer that are, are doing very well with this uh, free-to-play mode. And then you have the gambling mode that I guess you mentioned in your question, which is DraftKings and FanDuel. So basically you put money at stake that you can lose, uh, you compose your team, and if you do well, you, you take part of the pot, right? Uh, so that's the second model. And our third model is... Uh, it's really different because it's this intersection between co collectible NFT collectibles and fantasy. So you can think about it uh, as a fantasy game with a real economy of uh, fantasy of uh, NFT collectibles. So you you own your team and you own your game in in a, in a way that is truly new uh, and that is different from the old models of uh, fantasy, basically. Okay, so basically, um, let's talk about the NFTs um, that. Um, uh, are used at, as playing cards here. So um, the players are represented through the NFTs that you guys mint. Um, how, how are these NFTs distributed to the people who play? Yeah, so 
we are um, selling uh, the the players on the, uh, our mar marketplace uh, through English auctions. So the starting price is the same uh, for all the players. It only change um, um, based on the scarcity. Uh, so every year. We would put on the market 1,111 editions uh, of a certain player. All players are treated the same way, basically. Uh, so you have the unique version, for instance, of uh, Lionel Messi. The super rare edition is 10. The rare is 100. And the limited is 1,000, right? Uh, all along the year, we put them on the market, little by little. Uh, same starting price. And then it's English auction. Uh, and so basically, it's the market that, you know, sells the price, basically supply and demand, of course. Um, and then we have a secondary market uh, where users are, are free to uh, resell uh, their NFT collectible if they want to do so. Uh, of course, they can also move it uh, to like uh, third-party marketplaces like OpenSea and so on. Um, so what's the difference between the different tiers that you mentioned? So basically you said uh, rare, super rare and so on. Yeah, yeah, def definitely. So um, again, uh, our 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 product, our game is that um, you know this intersection of collectibles uh, and fantasy game. Uh, and so uh, when you think about this, two important aspects: one is the collectible, and so uh, these different quantities um, they hold different collectible value, uh, like the one hundred one of Lionel Messi, you know, like to the for the fans uh, of Paris Saint-Germain, Lionel Messi has uh, more value than the one that is minted at 1,000 editions, for instance. So you have a collectible value here. Um, and then you have uh, some value in the fantasy game as well, because owning uh, one of the scarcest editions uh, could help you enter different gamers as well. So that's, I guess, these are the two important things. Or is that, does that impact performance at all? So like if you're playing with like a unique card, Does it somehow you know, imply a, a multiplier on the performance of the player, or is it just sort of more access to certain types of games? Or? Yeah, you can think you you can think about it more uh, like access uh, than uh, than uh, than multiplier. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. And and generally speaking, uh, I like to think about NFTs. Um, as a way to access, you know. Uh, so of course, they, you have this collectible aspect, right? Uh, and there's some projects that are really successful uh, in that like pranks and so on uh, and, and and then um, when you when you mix it with access I find it cool uh, like because you own an NFT you are part of a club and you can you can access this you know gaming experience you can access this physical experience uh, and um, and and that's Yeah, that's a way to unlock things, right? Like, uh, uh, because you own this NFT, you, you can unlock this kind, this type of things that could be social, like gaming experiences and so on. And so that's how I like to think about it. Cool. I'd like to, there's so much here that I'd like to unpack. Um, but I want to talk about the licenses a little bit. Uh, Frederick and I were talking about this earlier and, and What, what bounds you to these licenses? Why did you choose to go the license route? And what are some of the complexities there? Because, I mean, you, there, there's NFTs out there right now. Like, I think there's one called, like, uh, uh, Rocks. And there's another one that, that just did, like, a bunch of sports players. And, I mean, they did basically, like, kind of caricature art avatars of these players. I don't think they have licenses for that because it's their own artwork. Um, Yeah, why did you choose to go this route and what are some of the maybe complexities of working with licenses? Yeah, for sure it was not the easy road. <laughs> uh, but um, I think that um, first, if you, if you relate to our vision, which is like help bringing crypto assets in the, in the hands of hundreds of millions of people, Uh, we had uh, a choice to make early on. Like, do you want to tap uh, into an existing audience of people and leverage it? Uh, and if, if the answer is yes, then it's easier to use the image of real football or basketball or whatever type of players, right? Uh, you can then, you, you have another road, which is you use like fake players or you try, you know, to, to do things without this, this link to the real world. But... 
we found it like uh, maybe less powerful and less you know impactful in terms of relating to our vision so uh, when you decide to go the road of yes I want to have this link with the real players and the real clubs and so on then uh, you have two choices uh, one is uh, you don't get the license and then you can start and you can do art and so on and like Uh, but in, at some point you're going to be in big big trouble. <laughs> so I, I want uh, so like uh, because like the licensors they have big legal teams that would go after you even if you do an artwork of a, a player that is even like somewhere close to a player that exists you're going to be in trouble, right? Uh, and then you have the other road which is you go to them and you you just explain it's going to take years, but you explain that you you are just creating like a new market a new product um, it's going to be beneficial to them because you're going to pay them a part of your revenue uh, and it's going to ex expand their, their brand to new audiences crypto enthusiasts and new markets and so on and that's the road we, we we decided to go and to be honest like i mean If I knew like early, like in 2018, how complex it, you know, it, it was going to be, like, I'm not sure, like, because it has been then a lot of education and time to explain that uh, uh, and, and, you know, to, yeah, to, to really, like, um, yeah, explain the benefits and, you know, why, why it's important for them as leagues and so on. And, and I think, yeah, we, we, we put a lot of uh, effort um, on that uh, and, uh, and now they get it because, you know, it's, uh, it's a new revenue stream for them. Uh, again it's um, it's you know more like helping them to increase their audience um, and developing a cool product for the fans so um, no we are in a better place <laughs> I, I can, can I just um, so I'm very much not a lawyer I'm a physicist by training um, so uh, bear with me can you explain um, the IP background behind this a little bit because in principle The players, they're public figures, right? So basically, the, they they don't have a right to say, you can't use my picture. If you take a picture of them or if you draw a picture of them, you can use it whatever way you please, right? And also the game statistics, they're also in the in the public domain, right? They're not they're not IP protected. So what what exactly is it you need the license for? So I understand that that basically it gives you an in um with the clubs and that they can also co-promote and so on um, because they also have a financial interest but you're not prohibited from uh, so uh, basically if I as a private person um, make an NFT with Thomas Müller on it that kind of tracks Thomas Müller's performance this is fine right not really <laughs> but I, I will dive into that uh, so uh, basically you uh, you uh, you um, uh, We get two things uh, uh, when we deal with the league. So one thing, as you mentioned, that is uh, t yeah totally right, is the marketing element. So there's no IP here. It's just you know having the league support uh, us in our mission to bring it to 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 to, to mainstream agencies. So like uh, post on Instagram, on Twitter, and so on. So that that's one element. Uh, we're going to start activating these things in the coming months. Um, and then the second element is the IP. Uh, and so for the IP, you need different things. Uh, you need the image uh, of players. You need uh, uh, that that is owned. Uh, uh, so players themselves can use it uh, independently from the clubs, but clubs can use it uh, under a certain scope. Like if you put all the players in the market like there's certain criteria that we need to meet but so you have the image of players then you have the image uh, uh, of the club logo this is owned by the clubs and you need the, the IP and the and, and the and the jersey and so on um, and so to go back to your example of Thomas Muller like if you want to make a profit uh, as an individual person um, from Thomas Muller image uh, if you do it without uh, the jersey basically like the, na the national team jersey or the club jersey uh, like Thomas could go after you uh, and, 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 and tell you that you cannot profit from his individual image because uh, you don't have the rights to do so if you do it uh, with like a reproduction uh, of a, a, a jersey even if it's not like a picture of the jersey but just an artwork around the jersey you could also have the national team or uh, the club going after you because you are using club or national team IP. Uh, so, yeah, this is, yeah, this is really 
touchy to do so. I mean, not touchy, like, it's not possible, actually. <laughs> so, so uh, I mean, this is kind of, that's kind of going off on a tangent, but say I'm I'm a professional photographer, I'm, I'm a paparazzi, and I kind of follow Thomas Müller around his village in the south of Germany, wherever he lives. Um, and I take pictures of him and I'm allowed You're to do so because... You're pretty obsessed with Thomas Müller, I gotta say. Yeah, so, sorry, I, I, I know like five players. Um, so I can, I can, I can, I can uh, say I go after Griezmann. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know where he lives. lives so basically I, I kind of, I find out, I find out which supermarket he, uh, supermarket he goes to and I take pictures of him. And I'm allowed to do so because he's a public persona, right? And I can, I can sell these pictures to Hello or uh, People Magazine or I don't know, what, what, whatever. This is very different. Yeah, this is, um, so if, if, um, if you want to use... Um, uh, the 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 image uh, for information uh, information like uh, like basically for newspapers and this kind of things uh, this is really different like uh, that's uh, and 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 I'm not the uh, I don't have any legal background I'm not the legal person so I cannot explain why it's, it's different but this is uh, because I mean when I started the company I was <laughs> like approaching the topic the same way you are approaching it and I was like. Wait, I mean, the, I saw the, I see this image in uh, the sports newspaper every day. Like, why is different, right? Uh, but the reality is that the newspapers are not selling them these images. They are using them for informational purposes, and so uh, this is this is yeah, this is a different setup from. Uh, okay, uh, so. From so I can take a paparazzi pit, a picture of Thomas Müller, but I can't put it on a mug and sell the mug as you know a Thomas Müller mug. That's correct. That's okay. correct. Okay, that's I get correct. it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's yeah, that's the and, and I guess that's um, it. It has been um, there. There's, there's been very few uh, soccer games uh, that manage to do that well at scale. So you have one example that is FIFA published by Electronic Arts, uh, and then you're in the physical world, you have Panini Collectibles. So these are the two companies that, you know, manage to secure all those, all those rights. Uh, but, but, but then there's very few examples of companies that, that manage to do it. And uh, so that's why also it's, it's a long process. This. I want to talk about FIFA in, in a few seconds. Um, but I, I want to ask you, like, what is it like working with, uh, you know, essentially, you know, Football cartels. Uh, what are the biggest challenges for you and and you know your team in working with uh, massive global organizations like this? You know, like uh, I learned, I learned a lot because um, at the beginning you want to explain NFTs and then you realize you don't want to explain NFTs, uh, not because they cannot understand it, just because it's not. Uh, you know, like you, you need to tell them the benefits, right? So, uh, and 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 in the beginning, I was like, uh, they were asking a lot of questions about blockchain and so on, and then you get, you get kind of uh, dragged into something that is not the, that's not the question, right? Like the question is, why are we doing that, and what's going to bring to you? What what are we bringing to you, right? Uh, and um and so yeah, to answer maybe your question more directly. Uh, for them, it's quite kind of easy now because we give them money, uh, we give them access to a new audience, and we just ask for the IP rights and marketing support. So we we tell them, look, we just need the image uh, of the player. We we need the right, we need the rights, of course, and we need your marketing support. But we're gonna provide all the assets, right? We're not you're not gonna do anything. So um, so now I would say that um, it's. Um, no, it's it's really smooth. Uh, at at the very beginning, it was hard to convince the first one. You know, it's it's always the same. Like the first deal, the you know, the always the first thing is the most difficult, right? And 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 then little by little, there's a kind of reinsurance effects where you have oh okay, this big club is coming into so on. so maybe and then the second one and then this third one and then you know they they get reinsured because they see that you know all all the big names are coming. Uh, you as a company, you are growing. Uh, you have like investors backing you that are known and blah 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 and so then then it gets easier um, and then yeah in the model again it's smooth because it's not yeah it's it's, it's simple for them right we, we try to make the, the life really simple <laughs> did, did it help that Andre Schuller is one of the early investors 
Yeah, André Charles is, uh, is an early investor. In Germany, we also have uh, uh, Oliver Bierhoff, who's uh, the manager of the national team. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have like many soccer players that invested in the company. We, we really try to be inclusive of uh, uh, the best in the sports world, like the soccer players, the leagues, the clubs, also in the crypto world, uh, having, you know, like some, some, some key people helping us uh, and in the gaming. So basically, there's three pillars like gaming, crypto and sports. We yeah, try to be, to be inclusive and having the, you know, some of the best minds um, helping us to develop the company. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, regarding licenses, do the assets have perpetual licenses? Because like if SoRare ceases to exist, I mean, these... Not, not that it will at this point, <laughs> but if Sora ceases to exist in some distant universe and and, um, uh, and the assets continue to exist on the Ethereum blockchain, the, the licenses, are they perpetual for those NFTs? And um, yeah, how does that like fit into your business model? No, no, it's it's a, it's a good question. Uh, so two, two, two level of answers. Um, so first of all, uh, one of the big progress I guess we made for the fans and for the gamers is that they can use the game item the NFT the player across the seasons so if you think about the existing video games you buy an item that you don't own at all actually you can use it during a specific season and then the next season you need to buy again right uh, so basically you you kind of lease the right to use something but you cannot resell it you cannot use it next season you cannot move it blah 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 so you, you don't own it right um, and so and, and so we, we did a lot of work to explain to leagues that that's not normal uh, you should use a digital item the same way that you use a physical one meaning that you truly own it uh, and if you want to do it right you need to, to have an NFT so that's the first part of the answer and then the second part is maybe more related to your question uh, is yes you, you truly own it uh, independently from the league independently from the company uh, and, and, and so I think that's yeah, that's creating a connection uh, with the fans that is that is new, that is different because they, they own part of the game, right? And, and, and they own this digital item the same way they would own something physical. So the entire crypto angle kind of um, hinges on the collectability of those NFTs, right? Um, so can you tell us about people and their collections and what they do with them and whether they display them and so on? So basically, how, how is that leveraged? How um, wh What value add is it to the players um, that this is a Web3 and not a Web2 company? Yeah, yeah. so um, I think that first of all, uh, you have the digital scarcity component. So uh, you can tell with certainty then, okay, we're going to mint 100 edition of this player on this quantity. It cannot be one more. Uh, this is backed, you know, by by the technology. Uh, so this is a first big thing, like just the fact that you can trust the technology for the digital scarcity is huge for collectors. And then on uh, how you can use it as a collector. So first, um, yeah, we are seeing a lot of really fun behaviors. Like we have people, you know, um, collecting all the serial numbers uh, with a specific like num number seven out of 10, this kind of thing. So we have all these kind of behaviors that are really cool to see uh, on the platform. And we also have new behaviors because um, one of the cool features of NFTs is, is that you can track the digital, uh, like the audit trail of ownership. Um, we have some users that, uh, you know, like pay a premium to own an NFT that has been owned uh, by a public figure, like uh, uh, Antoine Griezmann or Oliver Bierhoff or so on. And this is kind of new because in the physical collectible world, this is not as simple uh, to leverage this kind of thing. And in the NFT world, it's much easier to do it. Uh, and, and so we find this, yeah, this, this really cool. Um, and then in the, uh, like another... Um, um, you know, like powerful uh, uh, psychological uh, reason why we collect is showing off, like the social status thing, uh, uh, and uh, and this is something that is more at the beginning for us. Like we have people that are proud of uh, you know buying or winning some of these NFTs uh, of uh, players they love, and then they show it on social networks. Um, we don't have yet, um, you know, like. Um, like very strong ways to, to do it, but we are 
coming to it. Hopefully, at some point, you would put your profile, like your the NFT you want in your Twitter profile picture and so on. And uh, we know there's some initiatives around it. Uh, I guess that would increase the collectible value and uh, of, uh, of our uh, ecosystem. At some point, maybe you could move your CryptoPunk uh, uh, to be your profile picture in, in the Sora ecosystem as well, uh, in the other, you know, the other way around. Um, and um, and so yeah, that's uh, all all this uh, all these things. So maybe to sum it up, the digital scarcity, all the collectible attributes like serial number, design, and so on, uh, and then showing off uh, your NFT uh, on like a social network or virtual worlds, this kind of things. There were rumors that Twitter was uh, was adding a feature that um, verifies whether you actually own an NFT that you use as your profile picture, right? Kind of like the blue blue check mark, uh, kind of uh, that you get check mark. Uh, so basically, I could I could uh, uh, take my Thomas Müller NFT and put it as my my face on Twitter and be uh, NFT verified. Correct. Yeah, that that's what uh, I, I was mentioning uh, in in the answer, and this is something that, of course, we we are really excited about, like because uh, it's it's all about uh, uh, portability and 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 showing uh, your your NFTs to your friends, people you care, and you know just showing who you are uh, uh, in the external world, and uh, and uh, yeah, this is this is something we are we are very very excited very excited about um, that. There's also a way uh, to show your NFTs. It's not the collectible, but it's also the usage value uh, outside of our fantasy game. So part of our vision is uh, is to really to be this this platform for sports fans, and uh, not only they can use and have fun in our fantasy, but also in different games that are built on top of us. Uh, and so there's already many of them uh, that are being built by gaming giants like Ubisoft or smaller, uh, you know, like organizations, two or three engineers and designers. Um, and this is really cool because you know it proves the portability effect of uh, of these NFTs, the fact that you can move them away. Uh, Uh, and it increases the usage value uh, for the fund. So that's also really powerful. So there, there's voices that kind of speak um, of a new business model in that context. So basically status as a service. Um, how, how do you feel about this? Do you think this is something that um, is uh, going to carry? Or do you think this is something um, that is a fad and will kind of die down? Uh, you mean the fact that uh, NFTs are like a, a kind of status thing? You mean? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that you know it 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 is something that uh, we care as human beings, right? Uh, and if you look back, like last centuries, like showing who you are because of what you own in the physical one is a thing. I mean, you may like or not like it, but that's that's a thing, right? Uh, and now, if you believe that, and all the metrics um, show that we are spending more and more time in the digital world, then, I mean, it's going to be the same. You want, like, people are going to uh, want to show who they are uh, in, in, in this world. Um, so I guess that's, yes, it's, it's going to be a thing. Yeah. So I want to come back to this this idea that like people are building stuff on top of so rare because I think that's really fascinating and I think we we should definitely get into like how NFTs kind of turn the gaming business model on its head. Um, but just before, like, can you give us some numbers? Like, how big is the so rare community? How many? What's the dollar value of the assets that you guys have minted? Um, give us a sense of like how much value there is here. T totally. So, um, so to, to date, uh, the Sora community is uh, roughly half a million users. Uh, out of them, uh, roughly fifty thousand are pay active paying users, so that they bought. Uh, real NFTs and not uh, not playing with the free-to-play version where you, you don't have uh, NFTs. Uh, we we did that without any paid marketing so far. It has only been organic uh, growth, uh, friends talking to friends and so on. Uh, and this year we're gonna end up. Uh, yeah, and it's that was a good uh, good start. And you know, like this organic thing is really what I was looking for because in the early days, if you buy the users, it's I mean. 
you can do it and many companies are successful at it but I wanted something organic uh, before like uh, starting doing some paid marketing um, and uh, and yeah we, we're gonna end up the year with 250 million in uh, overall sales uh, on the primary and secondary market so that's a lot of engagement and uh, maybe the most important and, and, and for us at least and, and most exciting metric is retention um, like we have retention metrics that are very high it's above 70 percent at month three so it's equivalent at like comparable to what netflix has um and uh that's what we really try to to do well like uh the the game design and having this call loop working well and having people not only collect but play the game still like very early days and very rough in terms of gameplay but um we have something a call loop that is working very well um so yeah that's uh that's that's for some 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 metrics and uh, on the club side we have more than 200 clubs uh soccer clubs on board and um, yeah we want to onboard all the top 20 leagues in the coming weeks so we we made some good progress here Cool. And so, you know, there's there's a couple of startups, I think, that are building um, sort of products on top of SoRare. So it's like SoRare data. And then there's other games being built on top of SoRare. And I'd like to kind of separate those two because I think the games is like, that's like the game and market, I think, evolving. But with regards to like the, the like SoRare data types, um, do you have any plans to... Um, you know, fund some of these initiatives, like fund some of these companies or perhaps even acquire them at some point, because it seems like having all this information, all this data and like all these services built into the company would be valuable. No, t totally. So, um, so what we want to do uh, uh, is incentivize the creation of this ecosystem because it brings value to the to the to the fans and uh, uh, and there's you know s lot of these initiatives that we cannot execute with the highest level of quality right now because the company needs to be laser focused on improving the current product and you know onboarding these leagues and so on and so on uh, and um, and like oh are we going to incentivize the creation of this ecosystem so it has been organic so far with all these applications like Sora data and side games and so on uh, for sure we're gonna um, we're gonna invest in, uh, in in some of them and actually we already did with Sora data so they raised uh, uh, a seed round uh, and, and the, the, so are the company uh, was part of it uh, so we are a minority investor uh, in, uh, in SOAR data uh, we, we definitely you know like we'll explore order um, of this uh, uh, minority investments uh, we want to help them also with uh, resources, like you know, having a team in the company, helping them from a technical standpoint, from a product standpoint, and so on. Uh, so this is uh, this is also something uh, we're gonna do, uh, uh, and uh, and yeah, that's that's definitely part of our our vision, like in helping you know the creation, development of this uh, ecosystem, and uh, and uh, you know it, it goes beyond even um, side applications like so that or side games uh, it's it's also all the content creators like you know there's dozens of uh, YouTube content creators and Twitch uh, creators and so on um, and that's also part of our plans uh, like um, you know helping them to, to develop uh, uh, and to you know to bring fun and to bring uh, usage value to, to, to our community that's cool. Um, so yeah, I'd like to take a step back now and like talk about the gaming industry because uh, there's so much to discuss here. And uh, you know, sh shout out to my buddy Sergio who works at Ubisoft, who's my uh, <laughs> my go-to guy whenever I have anything to ask about gaming. I call him, and so you know, all of the big gaming companies like Ubisoft and 2K and EA, like they're they're all they're all getting into the NFT space in one way or another. Um, like Ubisoft, just down the road from here, like they have a blockchain lab. Um, which I think you guys were part of like early on or somehow like affiliated with. And, you know, they're all entering the space. Um, I, th the way I see things is like, if you look back in history, if you look back at like the disruption that's happened in the, you know, that the internet has brought over the last 20 or 30 years, whether it's, you know, publishing, um, video distribution, uh, taxis, you know, uh, hospitality, all these disruptions happened from startups and basically like, you know, 
either annihilated or like very much uh, you know damaged existing industries or disrupted them if you if you, if you will if you want to be nicer about it uh, do you think that like game the gaming industry is next on the chopping block with regards to disruption that that like these big companies that are immensely powerful I mean like EA you know with their FIFA license like I mean they're they're immensely powerful and they're they're um, huge profit generating companies. Uh, do, you, do you think that in like 10, 15 years from now, or perhaps even less, that these companies will still be so powerful? It's, it's a very interesting question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure it's a zero-sum game. So there's, there's a world where uh, we coexist, right? And we just create a new market, like a new way of building games uh, where, you know, like gamers have... You know, truly skin in the game and truly own their game. Uh, so w- what is for sure is that we are doing everything uh, differently. Uh, and if you take you know all the business model, the way we build product, the way gamers own the game items, like everything in- is turned upside down. Like uh, if you look, yeah, if you look at the the, the current games, when you buy a game item, uh, being uh, skin or whatever. You cannot resell it for real money. You cannot move it to a different game. You cannot use it next season. You don't truly own it. So if the game disappears, you lose everything, all your money, the time, the emotions that you invested. So, and it's basically everything we are doing it differently. Um, and uh, and it's so radically different that yeah, you know, I, I in the, we may have a world where like uh, uh, traditional uh, game studios and uh, and blockchain-based or NFT-based game studio coexist. Um, but again, what is for sure is that we are we are doing everything different. My take, of course, is that we are doing it to the benefit of the gamers because now they can truly own the, the game items and do whatever they like with it uh, uh, with you know total control and freedom, which was not possible before. So um, that's a totally, yeah, it's a total shift uh, in terms of uh, this relationship that you have with your community. The way that I'm starting to sort of form my thinking around this is the following. So, you know, before games were constructed around like strong game design, of course, like that's super important if you want engagement. But then also there's like the IP around the game and the protections there. Like, so you can't use it like seasons over seasons and like all these restrictions. Um, Maybe you can't sell a license or whatever. Um, But I think that we're... NFTs kind of shift this model, it's games will be asset centric. So what's valuable is the asset. And then you'll have game designers sort of competing over competing for dominance over essentially interfaces to interact with these assets. And, you know, like we had, we had uh, Jerome of Cometh on a couple of weeks ago. And like, you can kind of see this there where like, all of the underlying infrastructure that exists in the Comet ecosystem, it's mostly all like DeFi primitives. And you could just build you know, games sort of uh, interacting with these different primitives. And like with, with soccer NFTs, it's like a little bit different, but it still hints at the same um, trend, I think. Totally, uh, yeah. It's it's a very yeah clever way to to look at it, like uh, for, uh, uh, f- f- like like games becoming asset centric. Um, and I think it doesn't mean that you 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 don't want to be exceptional at gameplay. Uh, and I think that the the companies that will uh, be true to this DNA of being uh, uh, asset-centric and bringing power back to the gamers in the form of NFTs, but at the same time will deliver super strong gameplay, will be the big winners, right? Uh, but but yeah, I totally share this analysis. Um, and um, I think that the collectible aspect uh, is, um, is, is also super important for us because of if you are moving to a world uh, where uh, the asset is central, uh, then you you know like you 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 want to to you know you want to take care of it in a different way, uh, and you want to you want to collect it uh, in a different way, and uh, and uh, that's where we sit like at this intersection of there's NFT collectibles at the center of the game and the fantasy or the gameplay around the fantasy, right? Can, can I ask whether this kind of um how this fits in with 
the way that you've chosen your investors. So basically, you've done a Series A um, a while ago, and um, the VCs that backed you were, by and large, blockchain um, VCs. And you've done um, a Series B earlier this year um, at a post-money valuation of 4.3 billion. Congratulations, that's a, that's a huge success. Um, and uh, the lead investor this time was SoftBank, um, who, who basically SoftBank is not known um, for um, its role in the blockchain space. So how, how, does, how does that um, fit into the overall strategy in terms of where, uh, where, where you want to take uh, Sora? I, I see it as, um, you know, like, um, first of all, like, uh, for the very first, uh, you know, the pre-seed round, uh, only crypto people could make a bet on such a crazy idea. So <laughs> it was not, like, a deliberate choice from me, like, going after, like, crypto business angels and not, like, uh, it, they, they, they were the only believers, let's be honest, right? Uh, 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 because, you know, the, 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 ve the very early days, the early community, There, there was this people that got understood like at a deep level the technology and why it's going to be important uh, for the future of digital ownership and gaming and so on. Uh, and so we got them first, like the, the, the crypto people. And then uh, when we raised the subsequent rounds, we were like, okay, we sit at this intersection of crypto, gaming, and sports. So we have the some of the brightest minds uh, in the world of crypto. How do we um, get the support of the best of the best in the world of gaming and sports uh, and so that's how, that's how I built uh, the like you know the, the investor base that we have today uh, trying to you know to be inclusive of um, uh, all these people uh, and uh, also having people helping us build companies that can reach like a big big scale that's also where our soft bank um, you know, seats, uh, but not, not only that, but also the fact that, you know, the, the person that we have at the board from SoftBank, Marcelo Claure, who runs SoftBank International, is a massive uh, soccer fan. He owns three soccer clubs. Uh, and um, so he was, like, bringing more than money, like, basically uh, connections uh, and an understanding of uh, uh, the world of sport business, uh, which is very important uh, for us. Uh, and, um, yeah. So it's it's uh, it's you know different different uh, um, things that that you need at different stages um, of your company. I would say. Just before we um, we move on to the next topic, because I, I want to talk a little bit about the regulatory aspect here. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know that's that's you're gonna like that. Um, <laughs> you know, we we talked about FIFA a little bit earlier. The, the licensing model here seems to be shifting a little bit. So I think you're probably familiar with like the whole like FIFA EA uh, renegotiation right now, where I, as I understand it, essentially FIFA uh, EA had exclusive license for like any sort of like gaming thing that had to do with 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 FIFA. So like exclusive license across all of the gaming industry. And now FIFA wants to renegotiate that license so that it no longer has exclusivity, which is the case already in other sports. Like I think uh, like the NBA, for instance, there's like several gaming manufacturers or gaming developers that make uh, NBA games. Um, what do you think this comes from? And do you think that it reflects sort of a general shift in the gaming industry where You know, we used to have very sort of like monolithic places where people had went to game. It was either like console or PC. And now there's mobile gaming, there's NFTs, there's like all these different ways that people interact with brands through gaming. Yeah, what, what's your general kind of feeling on how this is heading? No, totally. I, I think that you can look at it at... Uh with two different angles. The first one is uh, for the fans. I think it's a positive because, uh, you know, when, when you, when, when you have only one player uh, at some at some point, or like I mean, one company publishing uh, games of a certain category, maybe at some point, 
you know, the innovation is not that high anymore because you have this kind of monopolist position. Uh, and, and I'm not sure that's the best uh, for the fans. And then you can look at it from a business perspective uh, for like, so you mentioned FIFA as an organization. Uh, and so maybe they, maybe they are thinking, look, uh, we, could, we could have three or four different partners uh, and the addition of this licensing fees or partnership fees could be higher than what we get uh, today with one partner. So, uh, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't have any insider info about it, but uh, I, you could imagine that they, they are thinking this way. Uh, and so if it's of benefits for the fans and if it's of the benefits of, you know, the FIFA members, then maybe they, that's a reason why they, you know, they, they want to, to expand to several providers. As you mentioned, that's already the case for existing leagues like the NBA and so on. Yeah, no, I think that's... Yeah, I think it's true that it does. It is better for the players and for the fans, like for the, for is, the game yeah. players, like the fans. For the yeah, um, for the fans, yeah. for the fans, for sure, because they I mean it's just more more opportunities, and uh, again, like uh, you stimulate innovation. Like if you don't have a monopolist in the place, right? Are are, are you going to stimulate stimulate <laughs> innovation by sort of encouraging? Uh, other gaming platforms to use your nfts and like you know like if if i don't know ea decides that like they want to plop so rare like give so rare nft holders an advantage uh in the game i mean i i don't i don't think you can really prevent them from doing that technically is this something you would encourage and yeah i mean Again, I'm I'm big on the on this platform vision. Uh, I think that's one of the you know the key aspects of uh, NFTs, like this portability thing, and uh, we're gonna incentivize the development of this ecosystem. We're gonna invest in it. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, I mean, you you put it very uh, in in a very smart way. It's becoming asset centric, right? So uh, game game item centric. So. Uh, if if uh, we we create these assets and if there's more usage value because you know there's different ways you can collect them and show them different ways you can use them uh, I mean it's it's also good for us let's be honest it's good for us as a company so uh, the the interests are well aligned here huh? like uh, you would have an ecosystem of organizations that are leveraging our audience our IP um, and that's also that's for the benefits of the fans and that's to the benefits of us as a company. So I think that you are well aligned. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the fun regulatory stuff because uh, there, there's some interesting things here I think that um, yeah. I'd like to get your, your thoughts on. So uh, you, you guys sort of came under fire in the UK recently and you know there were some... I think the the gambling regulator was saying that you guys should you know work, should be qualified as gambling. And like you know, you've always maintained that SoRare isn't gambling. I think you've done a really good job at defending why it isn't gambling. Um, I, I know that you've also, I think you've also been in touch with the gambling regulator uh, here in France. And I, I've heard whispers that the French financial markets regulator is also um, has you in their sights. Um, you know, I, I, I personally think that SoRare isn't gambling. I, I think it's pretty clear. But I think that regulators will make the case that play to earn, um, you know, it's it's existed for years. Like I mean, you, people have been selling gain assets for years, but NFTs just makes it more open and liquid and accessible to a much broader audience. Do you think that there will be sort of a regulatory crackdown on play to earn type games because it entails people like spending? money on assets and there is an expectation of say future returns because like these assets can appreciate in value and financial you know regulators will frame it as like we need people protected you know especially like kids because like kids are into football and all this like or into sports do you think that these that there's going to be a crackdown at some point here because i think there is I, I think that, uh, you know, when you are creating uh, a new market or a new category uh, and, and really like you don't fit uh, into uh, you know, anything from a, a, a regulation so standpoint, um, I think that you have two ways. Uh, you have one way where, uh, you know, like you are the bulldozer, right? And you, you, you keep on developing and you don't, uh, you don't take care of it, right? Uh, and you have another way which is proactive where you get in touch 
with the regulator. So you mention some of them, you get in touch with them and you explain what you are doing. You explain what you are, what you are not. Uh, and uh, and then you, you try to be constructive, right? You, you try to open a dialogue and to see, okay, what's the best, what's the balanced approach for our kind of product, as you said, to protect uh, the consumers. So I think that's exactly where we are in terms of um, philosophy, I would say, uh, and uh, also in terms of approach. There's no regulation, I, I'm, as long as I know anywhere in the world, like what we say, uh, well, that says NFTs should be under this or that, uh, uh, you know, like constraints. Um, probably there will be some in the coming years. Um, which one, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, but as you said, uh, yes, it, it's, it's, it's going to take shape in certain form uh, all over the world. I, I, ex I expected that uh that response from you it's uh you, you, your approach to building things constructively with with regulators i think uh is um it's, it's really yeah, the philosophy i mean great. and you you got to know me a bit uh yeah, personally as well uh so i guess it's also a personality trait right uh and um um i i think that's yeah that's how we build things here huh? like that's how we interact with human beings that uh yeah it's, it's 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 just opening a dialogue i mean so, sometimes we're not going to agree and sometimes there's going to be friction maybe uh but uh but i think yeah the process should be a dialogue right and uh we are we are in the middle of it and um yeah let's see what uh, like what, what what's the outcome Nico, I know that you're not the technology person at Zora. Am I permitted to ask one technology question, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would try to, to be as, uh, as, uh, as, as precise as possible, right? <laughs> cool. Fantastic. So um, Zora, um, in the early days, was built on Loom, and then you moved to Ethereum mainnet. And, um, I mean, then you moved to um, uh, the ZK roll-up um, from Starkware, StarkX. Um Can you talk about um, the motivation behind each of these moves and what you were looking for on the um, platform you built on? Um, because, I mean, obviously, um, moving your application over to a different platform, this sounds easy, but as someone who builds, I know this really is really painful so it's very i mean painful, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so can you talk about um the the drivers behind these moves yeah of course um so you it's it's uh it's it's first of all it's never easy um um, uh, decisions uh, because there's always trade-offs right uh and um between Use experience and what you want uh, for the for the fans uh, and security and decentralization and so on and so um, so we started with Loom uh, because you know we we found it as a, you know a, a good scaling solution on top of Ethereum and uh, uh, and uh, and so we we started there um, then it ended up. I guess for them as a team, as a company, not doing so well. Uh, so that was very painful for us because, um, I mean, we, yeah, to be, to be, to be candid here, like we knew about this, de their decision not to, you know, uh, keep on running, like really a matter of weeks and days before. Uh, and so we had to really like move uh, down to Ethereum uh, very quickly. So, so we, we did that. Uh, it was painful, uh, and then uh, so we we, we stayed in uh, in Ethereum for a while, uh, and it was uh, at some point um, you know we we were paying literally like millions uh, of euros uh, a month uh, because one of our key dec decisions, and I fought hard for this with the investors as well, uh, was to pay go gas fees like all gas fees. Uh, we always sponsored uh, on the platform, uh, and because I wanted a uh, smooth experience for the for the new commerce that come from a non crypto world, but at some point, like it became really crazy for us, um, and so we started, I uh, uh, think nine months ago, um, you know, looking at other potential solutions. So we we had a look at other layer one solutions. We had a look at 
um, several layer two solutions uh, with the aim of uh, finding a solution that is scalable, uh, that is sustainable, uh, and that it, you know it could help us um, uh, you know fit the the needs we have in terms of user experience. Uh, and so we went into this analysis that is maybe close to what uh, you know how an investor look at a company. What is the best team? What is the best technology? What is the best vision? What is uh, the best traction like uh, who is live who is not live uh, so all those things uh, and what are the trade-offs for the main criteria like uh, decentralization security use experience and so on um, and so we uh, at the end I think the short list was uh, optimistic rollups and ZK rollups uh, and so we found that for optimistic rollups, uh, like the user experience was not that good when you move from layer one and layer two for NFTs, like, you know, I think it's seven days or something like that. So, so a couple of things in terms of UX, we were not really happy. Uh, good fit for DeFi projects probably, but not that much for NFT projects at this stage of uh, the the technology uh, ZK rollups better uh, and then we had a look at different uh, companies building uh, with that uh, and so we ended up with Tanqua and yeah we, we are happy with it um, we are happy to you know stay in the Ethereum ecosystem for many many reasons um, not maximalist at all like pretty much agnostic again like what's the best for the users well, uh, uh, at this stage yeah probably it was the best decision uh, and uh, and yeah let's see let's see for the future so yeah yeah that makes perfect sense and I think actually uh, StackX was a really good choice on your part thanks <laughs> will you bridge to other uh, to other blockchains do you think that you'll have like a a Solana bridge at some point or you know, something like I that. I love to. I, for me, the ultimate, so, you know, true ownership is a key feature of NFTs. And um, when you think about true ownership in this world, like in this blockchain world, like, you know, bringing your asset from uh, Solana to Ethereum to other blockchains is what true ownership is. You can really move it uh, in, in, in different worlds and maybe you're going to have different experiences built on, in different blockchains. Um, is it for... Um, you know, like short term, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not even sure the technology is here to, you know, to make it in a smooth way. Um, is it something I'm excited about for the future? Yes. What's what's the like DeFi play here? And like, what do you make of, you know, funds that are now holding NFTs like Blackpool? And um, how does that play into the kind of long term strategy for SoRare? It's, it's a very interesting product and, and strategic question for us. Um, you can think about what we are building with, you know, this, uh, you, you, could, you could very much move into like uh, something uh, financial uh, and at the opposite of the spectrum, you could uh, go after the gaming and uh, the fun and the usage uh, play, right? Uh, and the decision we made is to be more like to, 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 to build uh, a lot of features and to develop the product in a way that is more fun that we develop the collectible element that you know the progression uh, uh, in the game is, is, is again more fun uh, and that we have we, we add more social features so that you can uh, chat with your friends and meet new friends uh, within the platform so that's more the direction we have uh, there's plenty of features that we could have developed around lending around you know like uh, 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 le same kind of features that X Infinity is, is doing like uh, basically giving your account to some people that play for you this kind of stuff uh, but that's that's not part of our uh, um, short term priorities uh, we believe you know like the right way to really penetrate a uh, sports fan uh, and go big with them uh, is to provide to them like more fun uh, and to pro provide them more social features uh, and that's what we're gonna try to do in the coming months cool yeah that, i could spend another 30 40 minutes just talking <laughs> about this one thing but um you know i'm very grateful for all the time you spent with us today and i i want to close this with like I want to come back to your entrepreneurial journey and I want to know if we, I want to try to get like a five minute masterclass. <laughs> um, so I, I know that you left Stratum with uh, lots of sort of lessons, right? And like important learnings. 
And, you know, I, I keep telling myself that you must have like had this list of like things not to do ever again um, if, if you were to start a company. I will open source it at some point. I, I would, <laughs> you should make it into an NFT. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I, I, yeah, yes, no, no, I, I'll, do, I'll do something. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see it. Uh, and maybe, maybe we could cross, you know, and we could, we could, we could share like what we're, you know, see if there's any overlap there. But, um, you know, what, what, are the, what were the biggest entrepreneurial lessons for you, like, after leaving Stratum? And what are the things that, like, you really set out not to reproduce and not to do again? And, um, and what are the things that you really felt that, you, you know, were really important? Uh, this is kind of a, a personal question. Yeah, you know, I don't know if it if it makes sense to our listeners, but yeah. No, no, it's no, it's. I mean, it's uh, for me like like I, l l let's say the main three points, right? Um, so one is hiring. Uh, uh, how, how, how do you hire? Uh, uh, what like uh, what what like, you know what what is how do you think about hiring? What what are your processes so that hiring is something that is. Um, It's not subjective, like, okay, I like this person, but something that you can rationalize a bit. Uh, okay, I'm not making a decision because this person is close to me from a cultural cultural standpoint or share the same background. Like, you know, how, how do you try um, to, to, to build a team uh, where you, you, you have diversity and you have... Uh, you know, like on objective criteria and not subjective cr criteria. It, this is something um, that I think is really important, that I personally did some mistakes in the past uh, because lack of process, lack of method. Um, and no, um, I try to be, um, yeah, you know, really uh focused and precise in the way we are, like having a process, like having uh, a way to evaluate the candidates, you know, all these th <coughs> all these things are really important because your company is only worth the quality of the people you're going to hire. Like it's just a human thing, right? So if you do a single mistake on the, on the five to 10 first hires that you make, you kill your company, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, because if you hire someone that ends up being toxic for the company or you know like you kill the company right so um so this is this is this is one very important thing to to me uh the second one is uh is about uh, uh you know product uh, and listening uh, to the to the community and, and and trying to be really really close to them uh, and to iterate based on what they say right uh and and uh, and and again trying to be objective here listen to your users uh and okay they Uh, they, maybe they don't have the solutions, but they know the problem they have. Uh, so you're going to imagine the solution, but listen to them uh, and, and iterate on, on on what they say every day. Uh, I, I say it's, it's really important. Uh, and the third point is focus. Uh, uh, because, again, at the beginning, is you know, like... Uh, you have very few people in the company uh, the only thing that matters is hiring building product and growing the community and if you don't have the focus uh, in the way you, you ship product um, then you end up a lot of stuff that are not exceptional like but yeah the, 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 for me the only way to To, 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 to build something massive is to have this absolute focus. This is the priority. This is the priority. And, 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 and also like having this shift be between this is the priority for the next three years and then um, uh, being able to go down to this is the priority for next month and next week and next day. Right? So you know, having this link between the big vision and, uh, and, and, the, and the smaller tasks that you need to achieve and be, being ultra focused is, I think it's, it's really important. So, um, so yeah, th there's all, yeah, three yeah, points where I'm, I think I, I did some mistakes in the past in terms of hiring, in terms of listening uh, to the community and in terms of being focused. Um, and well, yeah, no, I, I, I try to just do better. <laughs> I jump on this bandwagon of entrepreneurial um, advice. Um, so there's a bunch of companies in the crypto ecosystem that are successful in the crypto ecosystem. Um, but that are kind of hitting a wall when trying to grow with their products um, out of the crypto niche into the mainstream. What's your advice for them? Asking for a friend. 
<laughs> no, I think that first of all, and uh, I've been advocating that to investors for a while, I think that the crypto niche at some point won't be a crypto niche, uh, but would be like a movement, right? Uh, so like, uh, and, and I mean, we see it growing, right? So, uh, uh, so uh, because, you know, when I was raising money at the beginning, you know, all the investors were saying, yeah, but, you know, you are ta targeting crypto rich and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I was like, yes, okay. But I mean, this is going to be big at some point right and uh and uh and it's it's not bad you know to target these people right uh, i mean they have needs as well and so on so uh, so that, that i mean that's first part uh and uh, and then the second part is um like moving then um from crypto niche to i mean crypto uh, audience, I would say, to non-crypto audience, um, one mistake I did at the beginning was to try to educate, uh, ed like explaining what is the technology, explain what is the philosophy and so on. And when I moved from, okay, I want to teach to, um, l I want to show them the benefits uh, without explaining what's behind, then that was the that was the click, right? Like, so show them digital scarcity by telling stories and, uh, uh, and design and copywriting, show them portability by having, um, you know, cool side experiences uh, on top of the game. Uh, so basically show them the benefits uh, of NFTs, what they bring to this gaming industry in general, uh, by have them feel them rather than having it somewhere in a FAQ where you explain that an NFT is digitally scarce and blah, blah, blah. That, that nobody cares, nobody read the FAQs, nobody is going to listen to that. They want to feel it right uh, and so when i realized that then um you know i moved from like yeah trying to you know like tweak the walls to make it work to okay build the right pro the right product and make them feel that so hire the right product designers hire the right copywriters hire the right blah 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 so that they can feel it so yeah that's that's a way yeah i've been thinking about it cool um Oh, this has been so terrific, Nico. I mean, thanks so much for spending the time here. No, but I mean, I know that you're, you're, you're very focused and you, you choose your interviews well. And so I'm, I'm honored that you know, we could be uh, on your priority list. Um, so, you know, before, before we wrap up here, um, you know, what are you going to do with all this money? <laughs> what's, what's on the roadmap? Uh, and what's your sort of like five to 10 year vision? No, build, build, build. Uh, so, uh, you know, like um, it's uh, I, I want to make it big. I want to put crypto assets in the, in the hands of, you know, hundreds of millions of people. So it's very early here. Um, we with this money, we're going to hire the best, hopefully, in, uh, you know, all, all, all the domains, uh, marketing, product design and uh, hiring and so on. Um, we're going to um, we're going to acquire more rights uh, and go after more sports. So this is costly because we created this new market and now we inflated the price of uh, the stuff we buy. Uh, so uh, so this is a second big thing. Uh, and then, yes, we're going to keep um, building product and improving it, uh, making it more simple, uh, uh, more accessible in terms of price as well, um, and so shipping a mobile app. So, yeah, we have so much to do, um, you know, to, to raise the, the the product experience to the level we want so i guess those are the main areas of focus hiring uh licensing uh and more rights and um improving drastically the product experience fantastic well uh thanks again for being on hopefully we'll have you on uh, after your next big milestone maybe once you've <laughs> raised like two billion dollars and or something in a couple of years um yeah it's it's been terrific and you know just you know, speak, you know, I, Richard and I are still close friends and, you know, and we, we often sort of see, see you, you know, succeeding and, and we're just always, uh, very much like very pleased and very proud of like what you've accomplished. Um, so yeah, just want you to know that like, we're, we're very happy to see the Strata Mafia succeeding. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now you've been, you have been like instrumental in my, you know, like just helping me get this world uh, and, you know, like elevate me to uh, to this world. And uh, so, yeah, I'm forever grateful for, for that and everything I learned uh, uh, at your side. Uh, so, again, like uh, absolute pleasure, pleasure and, uh, and uh, thank you, Frédéric, for, for, the, for the amazing conversation too. It was, uh, it was great to be here. 
Thank you, Nico. Where can people go to find out uh, more about Sora? Uh, so I guess that our community is really active on Twitter. Uh, uh, so our handle is uh, Sora, uh, very simple. Uh, we have a very active so, uh, Discord community uh, as well. Uh, uh, so yeah, the, those are today the, 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 the two main places where the, the community is. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You. And uh, uh, good, good success um, over the coming years. <laughs> Same for you. Thank you so much.